No. Keen. I should give it to the Greens today just for keenness, really, shouldn't we? Just for something different. <laughs> yes, why not? The Honourable Robin Chapel, it's your last question in the House. You go for it. Yeah. I'm, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. <laughs> <laughs> no, you sit down. No, no, no. no. The Honourable there. Robin, Robin Chapel has the call. He gets to ask the first oh, question dear, today. Oh, dear, oh, dear. This is embarrassing. I know, but I just thought I'd um, throw the cat amongst the pigeons. Come on. My system's not working. Here we go. Get rid of that. Oh, well, it looks like the Honourable Alison Zamon gets the call. Oh, Thank you. Go, yeah. Thank you, Madam President. My question, my question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Corrective Services. One, does the Minister intend to advocate at the federal level for change to allow prisoners to access Medicare? Two, if yes to one, A, when? B, does the Minister expect a positive outcome from this advocacy? And three, if no to one, why not? C, one, ten. So we've got members who don't have questions oh, and others that don't question, have answers. Okay. But we're not sure who's the minister. Oh well, I'll give well, the answer now. Give it a go, it? Minister we're for Regional Development. We're free-ranging today in this last day. Um, so um, the file. I thank the member for the question, and the following information has been provided by the Minister for Corrective Services. One to three. Section 19.2 of the Health Assurance Act 1973 precludes the payments of benefits under Medicare for medical service that are provided by or on behalf of or under an arrangement with a government authority. This prevents prisoners accessing Medicare. The matter of access to, medical, to Medicare has been raised at previous Corrective Services Ministerial Council meetings and it is expected that this matter will be raised at the upcoming meeting scheduled for July 2021. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition, <laughs> Thank you, Madam President. Uh, my question without notice of which some notice has been given is to the Leader of the House representing the Minister for Planning. It's one, two, three. I refer to the State Government's planning for private and public residential development and ask one, does the, does the Government have a target for the number of residential lots to be developed and brought onto the market annually, and if so, what is it? Two, if no to one, why not? Three, if the Government have a target for the number of houses, does the Government have a target for the number of houses and apartments that should be developed and brought onto the market annually, and if so, what is it? And four, what is the Government's target for the number of public houses and units it tends to provide for the 2021, 22, 2022, 23, 2023, 24, and 2024, 25? financial years. Leader of the House. Thanks, Madam President. I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. One to four. The number of lots bought onto the market annually is delivered by the development industry. The demand for housing and consequently the development of residential lots fluctuate from year to year based on economic conditions and demographic factors. The Department of Planning, Lands and Heritage monitors the land and housing supply pipeline to ensure there is a sufficient stock of land to support anticipated demand for residential lots. As at the 31st of March 2021, there were more than 60,000 residential lots with conditional subdivision approval in Western Australia and sufficient stocks of land zoned for residential purposes or identified for urban expansion in the Perth and Peel metropolitan area to support growth for over 30 years. In respect to public housing, those questions should be directed to the Minister for Housing. The Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, Madam President. My question without notice of which some has been given is to the Minister for Mental Health representing the Treasurer, and it is a Thursday. I refer to the question without notice number two asked on the 29th of April 2021, in which you identified that $5.219 billion of iron ore royalty income had been received in the first half of the 2021 financial year, and I ask, one, with public sector net debt projected to reach $40.2 billion by 30th of June 2024, how long will it take for that net debt to be repaid? Mm -hmm. Two, when will public sector net debt start to be reduced every year and by how much? Three, what average growth in state gross, gross, gross straight product is required to meet this debt repayment timeline? And four, how much public sector net debt has been paid down by the McGowan government since, was, since, since the government was elected in March 2017? The Minister for Mental Health. Thanks very much, Madam President, and I thank the Leader of the Opposition for some notice of the question. One, the Department of Treasury advises a specific date for the repayment of the current forecast for net debt is not available. The McGowan Labor government has made the hard decision to repair the finances. Prior to COVID-19, net debt was around $9 billion lower than what was forecast by the previous government. 
This provided the capacity to respond to COVID-19 with an unprecedented response of more than $7 billion committed to support households and businesses and the Western Australian economy, as well as a record $28.9 billion investment in infrastructure. Despite this, Western Australia's economy and finances are among the best in, amongst the best in the world. Two, prior to COVID-19, Western Australia was the only state with debt decreasing. Net debt declined by $2.1 billion in 2019-20 for the first time since 2006-07. The McGowan Labor government made the responsible decision to change its focus from repaying debt to supporting households and businesses through the COVID-19 pandemic and our state's economic recovery. In 2023-24, net debt is projected to begin to decline again and may occur earlier, something the previous Liberal National Government was ever able to achieve. Honourable Member, I'm, having, I'm struggling hearing myself. I can hear so, you, Mr. Well, I can't. So I'm, so, right, okay. and, if, and if I can't hear myself, I'm not giving the rest of the answer. All right, Members, it's our last sitting day for this Parliament. Please listen to this minister in silence. Three, there is no simple direct relationship between the rate of growth in gross state product and the pace of debt retirement. There are many factors that will determine the capacity and speed of which debt can be repaid. Four, see response to one and two. The Honourable Robin Chappell, give it another go. Uh, thank you, Madam President, and a sincere thank you. I think I've beaten the, um, uh, the deputy leader of the opposition for the first yeah, time. Be rest assured I refer to again. question without notice, number 1320, asked in the Legislative Council on the 20th of November 2020. And I ask, given that I personally lodged the site heritage data in late March 2008 on behalf of Vincent Lockyer, who unfortunately has passed away, after having surveyed the area on the 1st of the 3rd 2008, and the site form that I submitted included reference to surface artefacts. Also supplied was a CD containing photographs of the artefacts. Why did the Minister of the Day say that there was no knowledge of the surface artefacts? Two, given that the sisters' remains on the other heritage site classification, ID 24950, is the sisters in a queue to be assessed for registration? Uh, three, if yes to two, what is the expected year that this site will be assessed for registration? And four, if no to two, why not? Thanks very much, Madam President, and I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question, and perhaps it might be his last question in question time, and I wish him the very best if it is. Uh, one, I am not in a position to speak on behalf of the Minister of the Day. Two, yes. Three, it is anticipated the site will be assessed in the 2021-22 financial year, and four, not applicable. Without notice of which some notice has been given is to the Minister representing the Minister for Environment. I refer to the proposed South Coast Marine Park and the Department for Biosecurity, Conservation and Attractions proposal to brief key Esperance-based stakeholders on the status of the project and to seek their views on draft community engagement strategy. And I ask one, what key stakeholders is DBCA proposing to brief and does this include local members of parliament? Two, if the proposal is not to brief local members of parliament, why not? Three, has the timeline for the establishment of the South Coast Marine Park been revised as a consequence of the altered consultation process? And four, other than the proposed briefings, what level of engagement has occurred between DBCA and key industry groups such as WAFIC and Wreckfish West? Thanks very much, Madam President, and I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. The following answers provided on behalf of the Minister for Environment. One, the organisation said the Department of Biodiversity, Conservation and Attractions, DBCA, is proposing to brief on the proposed South Coast Marine Park Draft Community Engagement Strategy. Our Esperance Shalarak Native Title Aboriginal Corporation, Goldfields Esperance Development Commission, Shire of Esperance, Esperance Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Gary Johnson Foundation, Australia's Golden Outback. Esperance Deep Sea Angling Club, South East Coast Recreational Fishing, Fishing Council, Esperance Port, Southern Seafood Producers Association, Shire of Ravensorp, Shire of Jerramunga, uh, Albany Boating and Offshore Fishing Club, Wagga Kep uh, Regional Organisation, South Coast um, um, Cetaceans. What, how do you say that word? Cetaceans. Cetaceans. Uh, Naju Native Title Aboriginal Corporation, Western Angler Magazine to be confirmed, and Shire of Albany. Uh, if the member is seeking a briefing, the Minister for Environment's Office is happy to arrange one. 2C13, yes. 4. DBCA has met with WA Fishing Industry Council, Wafik, and Wreckfish West on a number of occasions regarding the proposed South Coast Marine Park, including at a key stakeholder workshop on 2 October 2019, focus group meetings in Albany and Esperance on 10 to 12 March 2020. In addition, 
Uh, the Director General DBCA chairs a reference group on marine park planning issues that includes Wafik, Wreckfish West, Pew and Save Our Marine Life, which has met on three occasions since 2020. Wafik only attended the most recent meeting. Uh, thanks, Madam President. My question without notice of which some is given is the Leader of the House representing the Premier. I refer to the email exchange between uh, Lani Le Patterson, Senior Media Advisor, Office of Premier, Holly Wood, Senior Manager, Media and Communications, Lottery Western Healthway, and James Mooney on Thursday, the 1st, October 1, 2020, and Friday, October 2, 2020, obtained an FOI, which states in part, quote, we're meeting this group tomorrow, so if this does attract media attention, it will likely be over the weekend. And two, when organisations complete their application, are uh, there guidelines that, uh, that they get to review? And can we point to the fact that, uh, that they don't meet the guidelines in the application process as well? And, quote, and finally, um, quote, is there somewhere on the website that talks about inclusion and aligning with our values? <laughs> Honest, you can't, couldn't make this stuff up. And I ask one, was there any information on the Lottery West website which referred to inclusion and having to align with Lottery West values when the Margaret Court uh, Community Outreach made its application? If so, where on the website? Two, does such information referred to in one exist now? If so, where on the website? And three, did Ms Le Patterson inform or discuss this issue with the Premier or anyone from the Premier's office once she received it on October 1, 2020? Leader of the House. Thanks, Madam President. I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. One yes in the assessment criteria for the Supporting the Most Vulnerable Grant Program of the COVID-19 Relief Fund. Two yes, as stated in one and in the Community Investment Framework published on the Lottery West. If you can let me finish the answer. Um, two yes, and as stated in one and in the Community Investment Framework published on the Lottery West website. Three, as the Premier's office received media inquiries in relation to this matter, with Margaret Court herself issuing a media release, the Premier's media ad senior media adviser discussed the issue with staff. The Honourable Colin Tinknell. What do you say to a previous question? No, no, OK. The Honourable Nick Garan. Thank you, Madam President. So my question without notice of which some notice has been given is to the Parliamentary Secretary representing the Attorney General. I refer to question on notice number 623, answered on the 17th of June last year in which the House was advised that the Department of Justice had received recommendations from the Coroner's Court in January 2020 for legislative amendment of the Health Miscellaneous Provisions Act 1911, and that these recommendations were yet to be discussed with the Minister for Health. And I ask, one, has the Attorney-General now discussed the matter with the Minister for Health? Two, if yes to one, when did these discussions take place? Three, how many recommendations were received from the coroner? And four, what were those recommendations? The Parliamentary Secretary to the Attorney-General. Thank you, Madam President, and I thank the member for some notice <coughs> of the question. Answer A to D. The Attorney-General has not yet discussed the matter with the full Cabinet, given the coroner's court recommendation to amend the Health Miscellaneous Provisions Act 2011 was prepared for the ultimate deliberation of the Cabinet. The Attorney-General is not in a position to expand on the recommendation. He can confirm, however, that there was only one recommendation from the Coroner's Court and the Department of Justice and the Department of Health are working together to progress the matter at a departmental level. The Hon. Donna Farragher. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Madam President, my question without notice, of which some notice has been given is to the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Community Services. I refer to the Minister's answer to question without notice 73, asked on the 11th of May 2021, in which the Minister did not table a list of the eligible community service providers who will have their contracts extended as a result of the government's announcement made on the 14th of December 2020. And I ask, one, given the Minister for Mental Health, in answer to question without notice 96, has tabled a list of the 51 service providers who will have their contracts with the Mental Health Commission extended to 30 June 2022, will the Minister now provide an equivalent list of service providers who will have their contracts with the Department of Communities extended? And two, if no to one, why not? Parliamentary Secretary. Madam President, um, I thank the member for some notice of the question. <laughs> The joint press statement dated the 14th of December 2020, titled McGowan Government Delivers Funding Boost for Community Services, referred to both funding allocated to enable contract extensions for eligible community service providers and also a $15 million funding boost to support eligible community service providers. As advised in my response to Question Without Notice 73, a total of $9 million of the funding boost was allocated to the Department of Communities for disbursement across eligible contracts, including 
family and domestic violence, homelessness, mental health and out-of-home care services. The Department of Communities is also currently in the process of extending its community services contracts, which cease on or before the 30th of September 2021 for at least one year. Community service providers have not yet been formally advised of their extension timeframes or the allocation of funding under the funding boost, and this information will be tabled once this has occurred. Thank you, Madam President. <clears throat> My question without notice of which some is given is to the Minister representing the Minister for Police. I refer to the response to my question without notice asked on May the 4th, 2021, in relation to the Law Reform Commission's Firearms Reform Ministerial Working Group. The response said the McGowan Labor Government is committed to progressing firearms reform in Western Australia and will continue to consult with key stakeholders during the reform process, I ask one. Is it the Minister's intention to retain the Firearms Reform Ministerial Working Group as a consultative stakeholder to work through the Law Reform Commission's recommendations? Two, if no to one, why not? Thanks very much, Madam President, and I thank the member for some notice of the question. The following information has been provided to me by the Minister for Police. One to two, key stakeholders will be consulted during the reform process. Thank you very much, Madam President, my question without notice of which some notice has been provided, C126. To the Minister representing the Minister for Environment, I refer to the administration of the waste levy in Western Australia and I ask one, what total volume of construction and demolition or C&D waste originating from the Perth metropolitan area does the Department of Water and Environmental Regulation DWER, estimate was generated in the 2019-20 financial year? Two, of that total volume, what proportion does DWER estimate has been A, diverted from landfill and managed at a licensed recycling slash reprocessing facility, B, stockpiled, or C, disposed of in a landfill facility outside of the metropolitan area? The Minister for Mental Health. Thanks very much, Madam President, and I thank the honourable member for some notes of the question. The following answers provided on behalf of the Minister for Environment. One, construction and demolition C and D waste generation calculated as the weight of waste disposed to landfill plus that waste recovered from the Perth metropolitan region in 2019-20 was 2,190,388 tonnes. Two, a 88 per cent of the total C&D waste generated for 2019-20 was recovered. This includes C&D processed materials stockpiled as reported by premises. B, as of 30 June 2020, there were 680,387 tonnes of processed material and 633,762 633, tonnes of unprocessed waste reported as stockpiled at premises in the Perth metropolitan area. Stockpiled data for 2019-20 may include waste generated in previous Years. C, 3 per cent. Honourable Diane Evers. Thank you, Madam President. My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Forestry. I refer to the response to my question number 110 on 12 May 2021, and I ask, one, who is the independent auditor conducting the audit? When will it be completed, and will the results be provided directly to share farmers shortly thereafter? Two, how does this audit differ from that done by William Buck in 2018? See response to my question 2619 on 5th of December 2019. Three, how many share farmer agreements and transactions were audited in 2018? And did this include reviewing methodology and calculations against agreements? Four, how many share farmer agreements and transactions will be reviewed under the current audit? A and A, will this audit include a review of payment methodologies and amounts against the original share farmer agreements, and if no, why not? Five, noting the response to question number 110, will agreements with other terms also be audited, and if no, why not? And six, will the FPC rectify any payments found incorrect under the audit shortly after completion, and if no, why not? Minister for Regional Development. Uh, I thank the um, member for the uh, for the question, and the Minister for Forestry has provided the following answer. One, Price Waterhouse Coopers uh, is conducting the audit. Uh, the audit is scheduled for completion by the end of June 2021. Any issues identified in the audit will be raised directly by the affected share, share farmers concerned. Two to three, the, Pro the Forest Products Commission is unable to answer these questions within uh, the time frame given, and the Minister has undertaken uh, to ensure that the information is provided to the Honourable Member next week. 
uh, four, 82 softwood share farmers agreements totalling 193 transactions between the start of 2013 and the end of 2020. Payments are reviewed against the Forest Products Commission share farmer payment methodology five, yes, six, the Forest Products Commission will address any issues raised by the auditors. The Honourable Robin Scott. Thank you, Madam President. My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Leader of the House representing the Attorney General. I refer to recent reports that the Swinburne University in Melbourne was paid almost $345,000 to provide governance training to the Mara Wara Wara Aboriginal Corporation, the corporation recently found to be without a valid board and unable to account for over $28 million in spending. This is on top of the allegations of corruption in another Aboriginal group, the Kimberley Land Council, who recently appointed a barrister to carry out an internal investigation. I ask one, does the Attorney General trust the internal investigations of the Kimberley Land Council or does he intend to carry out an investigation of the Kimberley Land Council himself? Two, what is the McGowan government doing to tackle corruption in Aboriginal corporations? And three, what is the government's response to the allegations that their track record on tackling corruption in Aboriginal corporations is pathetic? Hmm. Mm, I'm going to give the call to the Parliamentary Secretary to the Attorney General, but I'm going to mention that I think that the first question, or parts of it, uh, might impinge upon the standing orders in relation to seeking an opinion. And so, Parliamentary Secretary, I'm not too sure what response you've got. I've got a response here, Madam President, so um, I shall give it to the, uh, the member. I think I might point out that uh, in his question he spelt Swinburne incorrectly to begin <laughs> with. Uh, Swinburne University spelled S-W-I-N-B-U-R-N. That's OK. Um, I, it's a personal uh, thing for me about how Swinburne is spelt, um, so I encourage people to get it correct. Uh, so I uh, thank the member for some notice of the question and provide the following on the behalf of the Attorney General. One to three, the Attorney General's role in relation to Aboriginal corporations extends only to charitable trusts. The Attorney General is the guardian of the public interest in the enforcement of charities. The role includes a duty to protect property the subject of a charitable trust or property held for charitable purposes and to ensure that the trust or charitable purpose is enforced. The role does not extend to the regulation of corporations under the Commonwealth Corporations Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Act 2006, the CATSI Act. CATSI Act corporations, including the Mara Wara Wara Aboriginal Corporation, are regulated by the Office of the Register of Indigenous Corporations, a federal body. Charitable trusts are not corporations, and not all Aboriginal corporations have charitable trusts. The Attorney General remains committed to reforming the Charitable Trust Act of 1962, and work is being progressed to achieve that end. The Honourable well, one last time, Aldridge. I guess. Thank you, Madam President. My question, without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Parliamentary Secretary, to the Minister for Electoral Affairs. Do I spell his name correctly? I refer to Legislative Council question without notice 82 in relation to electoral reform and ask one. Your answer suggests that Cabinet appointment occurred on 28 April 2021, being a Wednesday. Did Cabinet meet and agree to this appointment on this day? Two, please table any letters, emails, agreements, contracts or other documents exchanged between you, your representative or government and the ministerial expert committee members in relation to their appointment and the terms of their appointment. Three, how many staff have been assigned to support the committee? What agencies have they been provided from and for what term will they be engaged to support the committee? And four, what is the agreed hourly or daily cost of each committee member? The Parliamentary Secretary to the Attorney-General. Uh, thank you, Madam President, and I thank the member for some notice of the question. I provide the following on behalf of the Minister for Electoral Affairs. One, Cabinet met on Tuesday the 27th of April following the long weekend. The terms of appointment commenced on the 28th of April 2020. One, the information requested. Two, the information requested cannot be provided in the time available. I request the member place this part of the question on notice. Three, the terms of reference include that executive support is to be provided by the Office of the Minister for Electoral Affairs. Four, this is currently being determined. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, President, my question without notice, which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for Mental Health representing the Treasurer. 
I refer to the Ministerial Office staffing in the Treasurer's Office and ask, one, how many vehicles have been allocated to the Treasurer's Ministerial Office? Two, have any of these vehicles been damaged or incurred damage in any way, involved in a motor vehicle accident or incurred a speeding fine or traffic infringement of any description? Three, if yes to two, please provide details. Four, have any staff members, including staff on secondment, been directed to or volunteered to reimburse a credit card charge on their government credit card? And five, if yes to four, please provide details. Minister for Mental Health. Thanks, Madam President, and I thank the Leader of the Opposition for some notice of the question. The Department of the Premier and Cabinet advises that for the period of 19 March 2021 to 12 May 2021, one, six, two, yes, three, one, infringement, four, no, nil payments or reimbursements from government credit cards, five, not applicable. The Honourable Colin de Grusser. Thanks, Madam President. My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Parliamentary Secretary representing the Minister for Fisheries. I refer to the catastrophic effect of the closure of the Chinese market has had on the Western Rock lobster industry, and I ask one, has the government undertaken any analysis to quantify the impact of the loss of the Chinese market on the industry? If no, why not? Two, if yes to one, has the scope of any such analysis included a, an assessment of one, the ongoing financial viability of individual licence holders, two, the sustainability and overall viability of the industry across a range of product pricing and alternative market scenarios, three, the impacts on local businesses and regional economies which support the rock lobster industry, b, an investigation of financial, regulatory or general industry assistance measures, Three, what is the government's response to the Western Rock Lobsters Council's request for a waiver of the deferred gross value of production access fees? The Parliamentary Secretary. Madam President, thank you. Oh, um, sorry, my apologies, I've forgotten which portfolio you're <laughs> Miss Fisheries, thank you very Fisheries. much. Thanks. I thank the member for some notice of the question, and the answer is as follows. One and two. Government acknowledges the impacts of the China trade disruption on the West Coast rock lobster fishery. Preliminary estimates, as evidenced by the price paid to fishers throughout the season, suggest that the value of the industry could have halved from an annual GVP of over $400 million. The government is monitoring the situation, but the full extent of the value reduction resulting from the China market closure will not be known until later this year. The state government continues to work very closely with the Western Rock Lobster industry to assist the industry to minimise the economic impact of the loss of the Chinese market on fishers and continues to provide support to assist with market diversification opportunities. Assistance to the industry includes the initial introduction of the enhancement of the back of the boat sales mechanism, which resulted in significantly more rock lobsters being made available to the local community, restaurants, seafood, wholesale and retail outlets at prices comparable with or exceeding export price paid to fishers. Three, the government has not yet responded to this request as it is still under consideration. The Honourable Alison Zamon. Without notice of which some notice has been given is to the Minister representing the Minister for Environment. I refer to the Minister for Forestry's answer to my question without notice number 64 on the 6th of May 2021, directing questions regarding the impact on Carnaby's cockatoos on, of, on the, uh, Nang, of the Nangara Pines harvesting schedule to you, and I ask one, will the government commit to refusing to harvest the remaining Nangara Pines until such time as a sufficient amount of native feed has been planted and reached maturity to support the cockatoo population? currently relying on these pines, and two, if no to one, why not? Minister for Mental Health. Thanks very much, Madam President, and I thank the Honourable Member for some notes of the question. The following answer is provided on behalf of the Minister for Environment. One, further to the, to the response from the Minister for Forestry, a number of management activities are in place for Carnaby's Cockatoo on the, on the Swan Coastal Plain. The Department of Biodiversity, Conservation and Attractions, DBCA, works with the recovery team for Carnaby's Cockatoo to guide and coordinate conservation efforts. DBCA, in partnership with the WM Museum, non-government organisations including BirdLife Australia and the World Wildlife Fund, research institutions and community volunteers, is implementing actions from the recovery plan for this species to guide ongoing conservation efforts. Recovery efforts including the installation and repair of artificial nest boxes to improve breeding success, measures to reduce vehicle collisions with adult birds, rehabilitating injured cockatoos, protecting habitat and monitoring and research to understand the movements and requirements of the species. Uh, one action of relevance to the conservation of Carnaby's cockatoo is the Carbon for Conservation initiative, released as part of the government's COVID-19 economic stimulus and recovery plan. One of the candidate sites identified for the Carbon for Conservation initiative is the northern Swan Coastal Plain area, including the areas of harvested pine plantation within the Nangara State Forest. 
DBCI has recently partnered with the Water Corporation and BirdLife Western Australia to plant 15,000 to 20,000 native plant seedlings in Nangara State Forest each year over the past five years. This complements DBCA's ongoing annual replanting program within the former pine plantation areas to create habitat for the endangered Carnaby's cockatoo and other native wildlife. DBCA will continue to explore opportunities for such partnerships to return native vegetation to the former pine plantation areas of the Nangara State Forest and create habitat for Carnaby's cockatoo and other native wildlife. We're finishing early the Minister days. for Regional Development. Uh, thank you, um, Madam uh, President. Um, I, would, uh, uh, I would like to provide answers to the Honourable Diane Evers' question, questions without notice, uh, 83, number 83 and 90, which were asked on the 11th of May 2021, and I seek leave to have them incorporated into Hansard. Uh, I also seek leave to incorporate into Hansard uh, the answer to a question to question number 107, of which notice was given on the 4th of May. Members, the Minister seeks leave to incorporate the answers to both of those questions into Hansard. Is leave granted? Aye. Leave is granted. Uh, uh, Madam President, sorry, oh. just for clarification, there was three. Oh, sorry, altogether. I thought I misheard. I thought there yeah. were only two. So the Minister seeks leave to incorporate the responses to each of those three questions into Hansard. Is leave granted? Aye. Aye. Leave is granted. Are there any further answers from any member or parliamentary secretary? Madam President, uh, I, took to, I, I undertook to provide an answer to the Honourable Michael Mission's question without notice, number 62, asked on the 6th of May 2021. Uh, the answer to that question is the Attorney General has advised the answer to that question without notice is as follows. Uh, 1 to 6, the Attorney General understands the Coroner's Court is taking into account Ashwari's parents' views in considering whether to hold an inquest. The Attorney General cannot envisage any circumstance in which the Coroner's Court will not hold an inquest. Are there any further answers to any <coughs> questions from any minister or parliamentary secretary? No. 